Okay. Well, thank you for coming this morning. My name is Jeff Armstrong, and today we are going to do a little trip to memory lane. We're going to talk about modern BSD computing for fun on a VAX. And what we're going to be talking about specifically is trying to use a VAX in today's world, okay? So uh, I want to thank everybody for all the help with uh, dongles and laptops and what have you. I didn't know VGA was out of fashion, but... <laughs> all right. So today we're going to be talking about running NetBSD on a VAX, right? That is the current release. It supports the VAX architecture. Uh, one thing I did put on this slide is I did cross out retro computing. So what we're talking about is modern computing. I do not plan to use this computer as it was meant to be used in 1989. I want to use it in today's world, right? Effectively. So we're talking about a modern operating system. We're talking about modern packages and software, and we're talking about modern workflow. So I'm going to break this talk up a little bit. We're going to talk about setting it up on the VAX, or setting up NetBSD on our VAX. And we're also going to be talking about using it as a client, so actually sitting down and doing work on it, and using it as a server. So that would be having it actually serve up web pages. Um, or whatever, sorry, not just web pages. <laughs> so um, I did bring a VAX with me today. You can see it down here. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. I'll give you a little more information. So. A little bit about the VAX architecture. It was introduced in 1977. The last time you could purchase a VAX was the year 2000. They were available after that for like enterprise customers. They were manufactured till about 2005. But this is a dead architecture at this point. Uh, it is a 32-bit architecture. And generally speaking, these are single processor computers. There are such things as multi-processor VAXs, but they're exceedingly rare. So we're just going to ignore that for now. All right, um, so this is an old system. Uh, it's probably one of the older ones that NetBSD supports. <laughs> you can also think of this though, I know we're talking about VAXs today, but you can also apply a lot of this talk to any of the other odd architectures that NetBSD is still carrying along with it. So I happen to own two VAXs. I have, well, my first one is a VAX 4000 slash 200. Uh, that is not here today because it is far too big. Um, that is running a KA660 CPU. So this is about a 32 megahertz uh, VAX. And when I say it's a KA660 CPU, it's actually a card. I mean, we're not talking just the chip. There's the card on the furthest right on this computer is actually the CPU. And then it has two memory cards, giving it about 32 megs of RAM. Um, this runs on an expansion bus called the QBus. Uh, it was originally, I think, LSI 11 was the original name, and then they rebranded it. Technically speaking, this is a very old bus architecture. Uh, it's from the 70s, right? But uh, this VAX is a purely QBus system. So this makes it the fastest purely QBus VAX ever built, or fastest QBus computer ever built. Uh, this computer uh, was introduced around 1992, I believe. It has uh, a SCSI controller on it. Um, Emulex SCSI controller. Now, this SCSI controller is talking over the Q bus, so disk access is not great. It is going to be slow. It has 10 megabit per second Ethernet. And uh, other than that, it's very fun. You can see that there is no chance that this has a frame buffer. So we're not going to be doing graphics on this computer. Uh, the other VAX that I happen to own is a VAX Station 3100M38. And uh, if everybody can see, it's sitting right here in front of me on the table. Uh, this is a very heavy uh, desktop workstation. I had to cart it over because it was very unpleasant. Um, so this computer is a lot slower than the VAX 4000. It is a KA42B CPU. This came out around 1989. Runs at about 16 megahertz. This one also has 32 megabytes of RAM. And it has, uh, it has a SCSI controller inside. It's got a very fast SCSI disk. This one has a currently a 9 gigabyte uh, SCSI drive. I think it's a 10,000 RPM that came out of a server. So. This also, though, has a frame buffer, a monochrome frame buffer on it. And I believe NetBSD's X server actually supports this computer. So those are my two VAXs. So basically, we have two very separate different machines. One is more of a server architecture, uh, the, the 4000 that I showed you. And this one's more meant for a desktop. So what we're going to talk about first is setting up a VAX. We need to get NetBSD 8 on these little machines, or not so little machines. Um, so there's a couple ways you can do, do this. You can actually boot uh, ISOs on a VAX if you do have a CD-ROM drive. 
There are situations with CD-ROM drives. It would have to be SCSI, well, number one, so those are a little hard to find these days. And also, it has to be a special type. I don't really understand the specifics of it. It has to boot, it has to use five 12 byte sectors or something like that. So, yeah, that, that's the big thing, is it yeah. has to, because CDs are 2,000 byte sectors. Yeah. And, and and the VAX and a couple of other open firmware things only boot on 512K sector drive. Right. So, uh, here are the steps we're going to do to setting up our VAX, right? We're going to install NetBSD 8. We are going to bootstrap package stores because we want to use modern software on this, right? And we need to install packages once we're ready. So, I actually booted, net booted these VAXs using something called, um, it's called the Maintenance Operation Protocol. That is the VAX system for net booting computers. All right. Um, the NetBSD diskless how-to actually tells you how to do this, and it's very complete and very accurate, except for one thing. You have to use NetBSD as the server. Saying you can use Linux is false, and that is actually because there's something wrong with the uh, maintenance operation protocol daemon on every other operating system except NetBSD. Specifically, uh, you, it, NetBSD uses a different libelf, and what happens is the bootloader is an elf binary, but the VAX needs a mop binary, so the NetBSD daemon actually converts it and uploads it to the VAX on the way. Other systems that have this uh, server don't do that because they don't have a compatible with them, so it doesn't work. So once you get these net booted, we got to start installing packages. They have Ethernet ports, right? So this is pretty quick. You just download, no big deal. But this is our first sign of bottlenecks. All right. Um, one thing to note is that once you download those sets, they have to be decompressed. Now, on my laptop that didn't even work here because it's so old, it, uh, I think net installing NetBSD took all of five or 10 minutes, maybe, to download, extract the sets, get it up and running. No problem, right? On the VAX, it just definitely wasn't the case. So who here has used a, a tool, a benchmarking tool called SysBench? It's in package source, pretty simple. Okay, so you can run a CPU test. Uh, on my other laptop, I actually have results to show you, but uh, that laptop, it took 24 seconds to run 10,000 iterations of a, a CPU benchmark test. So, remember, with this VAX, I did say we have slow disks, right? I said that the Ethernet port's slow, but guess what? That's not the problem here. It is our CPU. So, this laptop over here sitting on the table, 24 seconds for that test. This is the VAX 4000 to run the same test, 19,000 seconds. So it's approximately 800 times slower than this computer. And you can see while it's doing this, installing the sets, that the problem is not the uh, disk throughput or anything like that. The problem is actually coming down to decompression. So now this VAX station 3100 I did mention is slow. It's slower than the VAX 4000. Let's see how long that took. 45,000 seconds just to run that one test, right? So we're up to, what is that, 15 hours to run this test that took my laptop 24 seconds. So are we starting to understand that these CPUs are not a pleasant experience to deal with these days, and especially on a modern computer? So I did install the sets, took a few hours on both of them. This one in particular had a lot of problems with NetBSD 8. I, I'm not sure why, but we did get it up and running. It could be that the computer's a little flaky, these are old machines at this point. So. so the next step after we do get NetBSD 8 going is we need to bootstrap package source. We run into a new problem. We have to extract package source. I bet nobody thinks of this as being a problem. So on the VAX 4000, this took, as I could sh I'm showing you here, 50,000 seconds, right? So we're talking 10 to 12 hours just to get package source extracted. We haven't done anything at this point, right? There's been no bootstrap process or anything like that. We still haven't installed any software on this computer. This, preparing for this talk, took weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even an exaggeration. So I want to thank the conference organizers for giving a lot of leeway on how, uh, how far in advance you're accepted. <laughs> so let's bootstrap package source. Here's some more results from the VAX 4000. You can see that this took two days to bootstrap package source. This is getting really unpleasant, right? We still have not installed a package. <laughs> so you're starting to see some of the issues here. It's very difficult to get these computers up and running for doing some modern computing, right? So 
let's talk about using this computer. Now that we got NetBSD kind of set up, right? We're going to need to install some software. And I want to use this as like a workstation, like doing my work on it, right? So I'm a software developer <coughs> by trade, so I have a few things that I expect to have working on a computer that I'm going to do my work on, right? So basically, there's a few things I'm going to need, right? I'm going to need a web browser. I do a lot of looking things up as it works, right? Uh, I need a text editor. I have to be able to actually program on this thing, right? I'm going to need some languages. So there are a few languages that I do use, and I want those on here too. And I need source control. I am a one-man team at my job, but uh, I still like to be able to use like Git. So. so let's start looking, okay? I did say web browser, so before anybody panics, uh, one thing we're not going to be doing or talking about is using the X server or any X programs, right? It, like I said, that this uh, VAX does have a supported frame buffer, but we're not going to do that today. <laughs> um, I probably could uh, try to start VAX on it, but I don't have a CRT that works with this. This is an engineering workstation. <laughs> Back in the day, a lot of these were fixed frequency monitors. These aren't VGA outputs on this, so it's a little <coughs> unpleasant. I am not a big fan of still holding on to CRTs at all, so we'll just ignore any chance of using graphics on this, okay? And additionally, like I said, the VAX 4000, no frame buffer. So you could use it remotely, I suppose, right? But let's just ignore that for the moment and move on to what we need to have running. So for web browsers, um, we have a few examples of what we can install, right? So when you say a console web browser, everybody jumps to links usually. I hate links. I don't like it at all. I don't like how it works. I don't know. It's not for me. So I'm not going to compromise on that. That's out. It will work on a VAX, probably. I didn't even bother to try. My personal favorite is one called W3M, if anybody knows that one. It's a beautiful web browser. It's a little one that lays it out, looks like you're in a regular web browser, and you just move around with the arrows like you have a cursor. Unless you have a mouse attached, I guess. So, awesome, right? Well, let's try to build that on package source. Guess what? This relies on a garbage collection library, right? And that library, because W3M is C++. That library relies on an atomic operation library. And the atomic operation library does not support the VAX architecture. Even though we are dealing with single processor systems, it's just not going to work on this. That's right. So W3M will not build on a VAX. And of course, you find this out after about a day and a half of trying to build this. <laughs> <laughs> so that leaves me with Lynx. Has anybody heard of Lynx, L-I-N-K-S? That was pretty good. It reminds me of W3M a lot. It's not my personal favorite. But it does work. It's kind of like a cross between the two, in my opinion. But it's OK. It does sort of work. Um, I do have it on this fax, but we are not connected to the internet right now. I did bring equipment for that, but I think we could try to keep this simple today. <laughs> so, Sorry, question. Yes? Is that because the atomic does it Good question. Uh, my guess is the library doesn't support the VAX. Yeah, I, I'm not. I don't know. Again, I'm not like a. I'm not a kernel developer or anything like that. I don't maintain any package source. I'm just a user. So when this doesn't work, if it uses it might be fixed. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get into a little bit about fixing these things that are broken on this. <laughs> so we do have links on here. Oops. Uh, this is just NeoFetch if anybody wants to see what this computer is running. So it's going to have to think about this, though. This is a tough one. <laughs> I was concerned about terminal type and what it's. We're OK. Don't worry about it. Is that uh, a serial connection? What's that? Connected to your serial? Yes. Hmm, we quit. So we do have links running on this. I don't have any web pages, so let's move on for now, okay? <laughs> All right, anyway, let's go back to this. So links does work. I do have a web browser. All right, not bad, okay? It does start. One thing, when it was drawing the screen like that, we are over a 9600 baud serial connection right now. So if you were to telnet into this, which is also unpleasant, um, it would be it would work a little better. So, so. You can do SS if you can. <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> so, um, you know what? So you do mention SSH. Let me just show you real quick what it is like to um, 
let's just uh, super user into this, okay? So this is <laughs> just sitting and waiting. <laughs> right. So you're starting to see some of the problems with maybe well, detecting shell. And, no, I had to look on the password. They never even got to detect the user. Okay, so it had to be that long. <laughs> yeah. So it's thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> We're almost there, right? You know, the, the, all this shows is how big and slow our code is. A lot of this is. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and how fuzzy your well, memory has become about how quick this computer was back when you actually used one. Well, does, 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 does anybody have a copy of Altrix? You see how fast it was like back in 1990. That's true, but again, we want to use everything modern. So, all right. Well, I'd say I have a copy of Hope would be a mess for it. So, for text editors, um, I just chose two. Uh, a lot of people like Vim. Guess what? That runs fine on here. Okay. Not, not very exciting. It takes ages to compile. I think Vim took me two or three days. There's a lot of dependencies that I'm leaving out. When I say that took two or three days, because I did build things beforehand. <laughs> uh, I personally prefer using Nano. Uh, I'm a simple man, so Nano is pretty fun. So that does work too. We do get Nano on here. Everything's stable and functioning, right? So it's a nice weight for everything, isn't it? Oh, we're going to be cut off a little bit. That's all right. So, all right. All right, so let's start getting interesting. So I do have text editors. I have a web browser. I might as well start doing some work on this computer. So I'm going to need some languages, right? So let's talk a little bit about scripting languages. In my job, uh, I use a lot of Python and uh, Lua, actually, for my work. And so my first thing to install was Python. I want to install Python. That is great. So uh, I also want modern Python, right? So I started with Python 3.7 I want to install on this Vax. Well, guess what? There's a little bit of a problem with this. <laughs> Python, during the installation, it compiles. We get all the way through that, and then it starts doing the uh, installation. One of the things Python do, does when it's installing is it runs through the bytecode compiler. It compiles all of its uh, Python uh, standard library into Python bytecode. And the VAX crashes when it hits test float every single time. And this is an interesting bug, because VAXs, unlike modern computers, use VAX floating point, right? They do not use IEEE 754. Well, guess what? Python assumes the processor it's on is using IEEE 754 floating point. So there was a bug filed with Core Python about this not working on a VAX. And guess what? It was marked won't fix. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. Well, I guess uh, Python 3.7 is out, so I do use Python 2.7 a lot. Let's try installing that. Nope, same problem. Does not work. So they refuse to support anything other than IEEE 754 floating point. So guess what? Python is a non-starter. But you can disable the tests, right? We can overwrite those test files with just nonsense and get an interpreter up and running on these little machines. So. So this will actually start Python. One of the issues, though, is, like I said, floating point is broken, right? That doesn't seem like that bad a thing. And it's only broken, sort of, right? I mean, you can do math on this. It'll work. The issue, though, is that for whatever reason, who here does do any Python development? OK. So you probably use pip, right, and set up tools and self active. OK, maybe not. Well, it doesn't matter if you need you cannot run setup tools on a VAX because it crashes with that bug for some reason. I have no idea why, and I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> so what does that mean? So we can't get a Python interpreter running, but we can't use any Python packages that we try to install automatically. So it's basically useless. So we can see that we're still starting Python here. It's going to get there. We'll move on, though, while we wait. So I think that shows Python's out. I can't use Python on this. This is useless for that, right? Yeah. How about PHP, right? Maybe we could run PHP on this. I don't use PHP at all, but if, I, if somebody out there is a PHP developer, you might work on that. Guess what? That's also not going to compile. So if we're just doing this straight from package source, OK, I'm not doing anything else, 
Uh, PHP will not compile because one, a couple of the extensions that ship in standard PHP require gobs of memory just to compile. So, I mean, we're talking people were reporting problems with a gigabyte of RAM. Now, this VAX has, this one in particular, 32 megs of RAM and 256 megs of swap. And during PHP's compile, it does kill the process. You can disable that extension kind of arbitrarily. God knows if package source would let it install after that point. Probably not, but you're just going to hit another one that also won't compile. So is it possible that it won't compile PHP because it has good taste? <laughs> <laughs> that could be. That could be. So PHP, not going to work, right? So let's move on to Perl. Perl is used by just about everything in uh, package source. It's a prerequisite to build a whole bunch of stuff, right? So in the process of building, I don't remember what, it had to build Perl. So Perl on this did dust and pile, and they actually have fixes. They faced some of the same problems that the Python interpreter did, but they fixed it upstream. That's nice of them. So Perl works great. It took about a week to compile on the back. <laughs> and that's not with dependencies. That was in that directory. I should say that I did not do any of these compile jobs, or most of them I didn't do on this computer, because it's painfully slow on this one. On the VAX 4000, I only had to wait a week to get Perl. <laughs> were, were some of these bugs fixed because of your reports, or were they fixed earlier? Earlier. Yeah. yeah. Ruby. Guess what? Ruby compiles. It runs in the vast. It's great. It actually works. That was a shock to me. <laughs> uh, so that one works great. Uh, Lua, that's an incredibly simple uh, wrapper around the C standard library. I have it running on an 8088. Works fine. So no surprises there. And of course, Bash, if you like the Bash shell, there we go. That works too. We can compile that. That took about a day to build just straight up by itself. But these are our options, right? So you can see we did knock off a couple big ones there. So what about compiled languages, right? <laughs> so uh, NetBSD ships with GCC 5.5 comes back. And we're pretty architecture limited here. I do not believe that GCC supports the VAX with back, uh, back end at all anymore. So this is on NetBSD's developers to keep this platform chugging along even slightly. So the other problem with saying that is like, um, I can't use modern GNU Fortran on this. I do a lot of Fortran work, too, on my job. And that's not going to happen. And trying to compile GCC on a VAX would probably be uh, pure misery. So my electric bill is already way too high. Now, if you're thinking of using any compiled languages that aren't these two, you're going to be basically out of luck. You're not going to, let's face it, you're not going to get Go, even though there's a GNU Go compiler. I don't think we're going to see that on the VAX anytime soon, right? Uh, Rust, uh, obviously, is not going to work. So. And if you're talking about even more like uh, odd examples, I mean, the free Pascal compiler or something like that, that doesn't have a VAX back end. That's not going to happen. So, so with GCC, what are the NBC's numbers trying to push patches on the And? The last few weeks. The problem they've got is legal. No one knows if the FSFO has to change it. So it's a snafu there. Oh. And it's a common snafu, unfortunately, for BSD users. So there's no rights. Significant code changes, latest of the year, first of these going, I'm going to write this from scratch again. Mm. So they got caught on that. That was only a couple of weeks ago. Interesting. Okay. So, so clean room for the same changes. That would be nice. Mm. I don't think I can. <laughs> <laughs> So that gives us a little rundown of what languages we can use. What about source control? I said I use source control all the time on this VAX. How about subversion, right? That's an old one. I don't use it anymore, right? Guess what? That requires the Apache portable runtime, and that has a dependency on Python, so we don't have subversion. <laughs> How about Mercurial? Well, that is pure Python, so that is also not going to happen, right? Git. Well, Git kind of does, and does work. There's a few little issues that you have to get around. Uh, the biggest one is that uh, Git's documentation has to be compiled, if you will, 
using uh, XML uh, style sheets, right? It's, that is not going to work in 32 megabytes. So it's just not even an option on the fax. So to get around that, and we can get around that, <laughs> we, I actually force installed uh, the AMD64 package of Git docs, and then we can finish building Git on the fax. And so we do actually have a functioning Git client. See, oh, see, Python started. Isn't that exciting? Oh, did I get that wrong? It takes too long to do something. So, <laughs> right, so we do actually have Git on this computer. There is a problem with using Git on this computer, though. I can't, I don't have a network connection, so I can't show you right now. Um, but Git relies on uh, curls, on the curl libraries to do its, uh, you know, all its transactions, or not transactions, pulling down stuff. And curl cannot finish the uh, TLS handshakes in time. So <laughs> when you see that verbose and you see the messages go by, it's making a connection, and then the, I think the other end just says, ah, forget him, he's not here. So you get cryptic errors saying that there's still um, random amounts of data that have to be downloaded, but it's because there's no information. Go ahead. The SSH demo on NBC is an increased timeout for that. <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody hear that? There's an increased timeout for that. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so that is one of the problems. So what did we get out of this for using it as a client? Basically, I don't have source control, right? I don't have a couple of the languages that I expect to be using, especially Python. This is not the best situation, right? <laughs> so let's look at using this a little bit differently, right? Let's try using our backs as a server, okay? Now, what do I mean? when I say server, let's look at a few, three different options, right? We can use it as a file server, right? So if it's in my internal network, I could be serving files to everything else in my house off of VAX, which seems a little silly, but whatever. Web serving, right? We could do that on a VAX, no problem, probably. Let's give it a shot. And obviously remote shell. So what if you were to use this computer to let lots of people log in and use it as a client, huh? That sounds like a fun idea. So, file serving, all right, NFS. That's going to work fine on a fax. It's, yeah, this is not surprising. It's NetBSD, right? How about Samba, right? I know in my description I mentioned Samba and how long it took to compile. So ages ago, and by ages 2005, I was using this VAX 3100 as a file server in my house. Okay, and it was running Samba 2 on it, and it worked fine. It took about three days to build Samba back on NetBSD 2.0, I think it was running. Maybe a release candidate or two. It was pretty old. Um, but I want to use modern Samba, so I tried to install Samba 4 on this, and guess what? Samba 4 requires Python. <laughs> out. <laughs> so we can't do Samba 4. So let's try Samba 3. Guess what? That also does, so that's just a non-starter. I can't install this. FTP, no big surprise. Of course it works. That's not very surprising. I mean, that's not very interesting, right? So we lost Samba on that for file server. Not great. Web servers. You have the one that comes with NetBSD, and somebody actually compiled Nginx for the VAX. Um, it's sitting in the pre-compiled binaries on, for at least package source 2018 quarter four, I believe. So uh, you could run that Nginx on this if you want. Nginx is pretty low memory requirement, so that's not too surprising. But is that really interesting? I mean, that's just static web pages. Is anybody surprised that that works? So what we really want to do maybe is uh, Oh, come on, there we go. Maybe we want to do some web apps, right? How about Django? I use that. Yeah, well, Python, right? So that's not going to work, huh? How about WordPress? Oh, we don't have PHP either. <laughs> How about Ruby on Rails? Oh, that <coughs> you can run Ruby on Rails. It is super slow, and it's going to require a lot of memory. So I was getting um, the process killed on my VAX 4000 for memory, just setting up a new Rails application. So I actually have it installed, which is a pleasant surprise, but uh, in fact, it might be, let me see here, if we just do user, I might not have put it on the little one here. Ah, all right, so we don't have it on this one, I apologize, but you can run Ruby on Rails on this, it would probably be miserable. One of the Things we have to remember, though, when we're running Rails on this, is we're going to be stuck with SQLite as our back-end database, because I, I, I guess maybe you could compile 
something more professional, but it's probably not going to happen on this computer. And besides, the CPU is our bottleneck. We don't need a uh, big database. <laughs> so the situation for serving, not particularly great so far, right? What about remote shell? Well, you have login times. It is not a pleasant experience. I think you guys just saw me try to um, just just uh, super user into this, right? It takes forever to, to just try to get through the uh, password script, or try to figure out the password. We can probably, let me see, if I tell that to local host here. So this whole experience is unpleasant. And even now you're like, well, this is gonna be plain text. This should be easy, right? <laughs> so, oh, okay. So it's gonna try to use secure login, right? This is not going to go well. I always forget. So I never connect to it from another NetBSD machine. I try to do it from Linux, which doesn't support this, which makes the whole process a lot faster. <laughs> so I don't know uh, if you guys have very patient users, but I mean, we haven't seen the password prompt yet. So this is not what I would call a fun experience. This whole system compiles a shared library. Uh huh. <laughs> All right, all right, we have a chance. Okay, well, I guess I <laughs> So, you're gonna run into a lot of problems with like um, processing power on this, just trying to log in, log in times. And the memory limitations are catastrophic. All right, uh, as an example, when I'm, I usually, when I'm building a package source, uh, I'm running a Tmux, right? That works fine on the vast as part of NetBSD's base installation, but uh, that's consuming about, when it's just displaying, I'm using about 15% of the processing power on the VAX 4000 at least, and you're using, you're already consuming five or six megabytes of RAM, so this is just not feasible to have multiple users doing this, which is a shame because, for example, my VAX 4000 has serial port support for 24 uh, serial terminals built into it, and that's not going to work on NetBSD 8. It's just not an option. And a lot of this is just because of how hard it is to even use for the encryption aspects of this. It's just misery. So is the VAC still a feasible architecture? Well, clearly, it's not for everyone, right? In fact, for me, it's not for me. I can't run Python on it. That's a killer for some of the work I do. Right? And it's going to require a whole, whole lot of patience. I mean, this is just slow. If you need to install a package, this is days upon days of waiting for it to actually build. It requires a lot of patience. So it's just to do a very basic task, it's just going to take forever. Oh, and we went to the beginning for some reason. Uh oh. I don't like what you said. You okay with that? <laughs> so what what are the where can we improve things? Well, I mean, oops. Faster cryptography would be nice. Let's face it, though. What are we going to do? This processor is what it is. We're not going to. And we want to work in a modern world. We can't use 1990s uh, style cryptography. That's not going to do anything for us at all, right? So you could maybe. Some people are always like, oh, why don't you hand code a, a sem fax assembly cryptography library? What do you? What are you going to get? It's five or ten percent better speed out of it. That's not going to do anything in this situation. If your cryptography runs fast on that machine, then it's not very secure. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it might be secure on that machine, but it's not on anything else. What about some of uh, NetBSD's default actions? Okay, one thing that is a killer on this computer is make man DB on a default install. That is a daily process. <laughs> Runs in cron every day. You know how long it takes on this computer? About five hours to go through it. So five hours every day, the CPU is completely consumed trying to do this. You can hear the disk roaring inside as it searches files. It's not pleasant. Uh, things like that. Um, the package, uh, package source uh, administration pass, I think it checks for vulnerabilities. That's also daily. And that's not pleasant. That also bogs these things down to make them useless while it's trying to finish that up. So things like that, maybe on these older architectures, probably shouldn't be daily, especially since I'm not getting any new uh, man pages in a day. Is <laughs> <laughs> this start? Uh, it's a question more, why does it start? 
postfix? Yeah. I don't think it, I'm not sure. I'd have to check. On this one, probably not, but. He does most of his stuff. No. He does. But <laughs> I don't know what this one's got running right now. Not much happening. Okay. okay. <laughs> you can see top is pulling what? 10% of my CPU power? Of course. <laughs> so a lot of those default actions probably need to get you know, fixed. What about floating point emulation? So that was one um, idea I saw about trying to fix like, Python on the back. Since upstream has literally no interest in actually supporting it from my understanding. Yeah? Uh, they do have some uh, conditional, if you have the right kind of post possible. So they think they don't. <laughs> I, I've contributed to Python a couple times, core Python, and I find them to be very unaccepting of things that are off the norm. They are not interested in supporting things that aren't Windows, Mac, and Linux, and even Windows is questionable. They get a little, uh, they get a little angry if you try to do anything like that. So they're not even interested in alternative compilers a lot of the time, let alone in architecture. So. A weird question. You tried micro. I have not tried that, no. I was trying not to make any compromises on that one. I wanted actual, yeah. My way or my way. So, but no Python breaks a lot of things, right? We have a whole bunch of packages that just aren't even going to happen on this computer. So that's kind of a bummer. If we emulated like IEEE 754 floating point, it would be slow. I mean, we're already slow, and now we're going to do floating point emulation. On the other hand, I could get things to work, like Samba, which would probably be miserable to use, too, but you never know. So a lot of you might be saying, does this matter to anyone? <laughs> right? So how about uh, anybody on exotic hardware? Yes, it does matter to you. So the VAX is, at this point, probably considered exotic hardware. Uh, at the time, it wasn't. I mean, this was a lot of benchmarks used to measure themselves against VAXs. So you should really think about this in terms of, like, if you're on some chip that's not AMD64 or, uh, let's say, maybe ARM, then you're in a little bit of danger here. So, uh, and you might be saying, well, I'm using, I'm using this chip. It's, it, they still make it. It's new. Um, you know, it, there's no danger of it disappearing. The VAX is ancient, right? Well, I mean, things like that happen. Uh, if anybody's ever heard of like uh, the Amiga One systems, they're uh, next generation Amiga hardware. You've got two. I've got two. Okay. I don't know if you saw, they have a board that's currently being beta tested, the Tabor. I've got one. You have a Tabor. Yes. I am actually kind of jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. The concern, this is a board that's being beta tested still, right? GCC announced they were dropping or deprecating its floating point units on this chip that it uses for its CPU. It's brand new. It hasn't even, I can't buy one. <laughs> so you have to think about this, like these upstream projects, when you're on these strange hardware platforms, they, they might not be very receptive to when you say, hey, you know, you broke my computer. A lot of them are going to say, I don't care. No. What about everyone else? Should they care about this? Does this matter? Yes. I think we've shown that NetBSD 8 is pretty slow on this computer, if I'm correct, right? The default install is a little bit brutal to use. Um, I did have, like I said, NetBSD 2 running on this. Felt a little snappier. Of course, we weren't using a lot of encryption stuff. It used to be the default, like uh, MakeManDB was a weekly process back then. I did look that up, and yeah, that was nice. But this does kind of show that uh, this operating system is getting a little bit bigger a little bit slower as we move on. I understand its features, but you should keep in mind that one of our benchmarks, somebody once said, I can't remember which project it was from, but we keep the VAX working because it gives us a warning if our code is getting a lot slower, right? So that pretty much wraps up the talk. Uh, here's some of my contact information. Um, I did want to say, uh, what did I want to say? These illustrations in here, they actually were from my book by Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, Introduction to Basic. It's completely uncredited, and I always like the pictures, so it's not like a, uh, um, 
It's not like a uh, copyright violation thing, I hope, because they don't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, right. Somebody does. But so uh, also, I will point out um, the web address at the top of the window right there, where I'm serving this from. This is the VAX 4000 that served up this presentation in my basement. So you guys can all connect to that web address and see the slides and wait, because I think a couple of the pictures are about half a meg, so it's going to take a while to download. But uh, here we go. We are using it as a server. Cool. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, have you been able to run it on uh, SimH or Charlotte emulator to boost some of the compile speeds to get that out of the way? I have not. No, I was. Uh, I realize that it can, but no, I haven't tried that yet. Um, sort of defeats the purpose, but you need know, <laughs> some of the pain, right? I'm wondering how. Well. Yeah, yeah, I just haven't tried it, so I, I don't have anything to speak to that. I also like, you know, consuming gobs of electricity out of my wall, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So that's not fair. I'm, I'm more of a producer guy. I'm not terribly knowledgeable on electricity. But do you have access to any kind of profile on it? So you can figure out, like, you know, like when you're resting when you're just sitting there for 30 seconds, can you figure out what's going on? I haven't looked at that. I had enough trouble getting this <laughs> set up with some software to use for this uh, talk that, no, I couldn't. I couldn't get that far into it, but uh, that would be interesting to look at to see where it is actually getting bogged down. So, cross compilation. Have you looked at any cross compilation? I have not. No, no. So, um, what about BCC alternatives? BCC. We have LCC. BCC. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't know that. I mean, that might help with something. GCC is a bit of a hog on these computers. So. <laughs> it might take a while to bootstrap GCC, too. I don't even want to think about how bad that would be, so trying to bootstrap GCC. I'll come right back. Go ahead. Yeah, so do you have. I'm wondering if, speaking of compilers, I'm wondering if the back end into the platform is good on it, and they may be producing less than I'm wondering if, if you can make. If you have an old compile option for ancient file, you can compile and compile the same, basically, you know, the 1990 version of whatever it is, and compare that to some modern compiler, and compare that to Right. The only thing I'd say about that is VAX is a bit of a complicated instruction set. I mean, yeah. it's, that is the. One of my college classes was VAX assembly program. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's very rich, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I would be shocked if modern. GCC is taking any advantage of what it possibly could do, I guess. Is, is mm -hmm. GCC 2.7 times, uh, so when the two machine was modern, um, the C preprocessing uh, part was more or less like just internal instruction set and nothing else because it was all fully featured. Oh, <laughs> interesting. So the, um, I actually delivered software on this back in the day. Yeah. Uh, we had a 5100, which I still have. Uh, GCC was, because uh, we delivered satellite imaging stuff, we were quite concerned because we wanted GCC on every platform, delivered on 34. But it was well known, the VAX, the GCC was a lot slower. So you might actually get into the Elfrix compiler. Yeah. Which one the Elfrix compiler is on now? NetBSD, I think, does support Ultrix binaries. Like, if, if you got the Ultrix installed and pulled that compiler, you might find it a lot faster. It, like, I don't it was, have it was, a, it was double in some cases. It's it's the, I saw the same thing on Alpha at the same time. Yeah. It's really nice. Double in some cases. Mm -hmm. But that could make a difference for you. Maybe. Have you searched for the newer Mac models? Probably have. I could really tell if it's more to work. Oh, was it? Uh, well, well, no. It, it's, you have to remember that even OpenVMS Alpha used different microcode to put the damn VAX I trip or the VAX floating point onto the because Alpha. That was to put backwards compatibility, right? Yeah. So that you mm -hmm. can run the old software that was compiled with the old thing. That's what I'm thinking. It, it's the later. If you could run either IEEE, so there were some 
if you're running your floating point implementation. So I think if you look at like a 6,000 or a 9,000. <laughs> I, I, you know, I have a 9,000. So 6,000, yeah. fast 9,000 is a quote mainframe. Yes, so I think those are, that's an example. I think they ship so, with four CPUs, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. They, uh, if you got a later one, they were known as the, that was the Aquarius model. Yeah. Water cooled, leaked everywhere. Terrible machines. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> some people know, may know Jet Western Regional Lab, Jet, Jet World, when you actually have that, you run originally at 6,000, but it became a 9,000. So I don't have access to anything more powerful than these two. So. I would say I'm incredibly impressed that you managed to get this far. <laughs> <laughs> also, because I think at the end of GCC, four times Max was deprecated by GCC and then Max almost re added it to a fine view. Okay. I think that was the first So, yeah, five or five or five. So, does that mean it'll be in GCC 7 uh, still? I can see Max. Yeah, yeah. The shadow man is busy speaking to him. Santa Claus is okay. Well, that's great news. We've got a combo. Sorry, uh, don't go ahead. Yes. Can you take out the box number? I can't. I don't. Uh, I feel like shit is good. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to what bugs.python.org, I think if you just search for VAX, there's that's the first one to come up. It's marked <laughs> won't fix, and there's a lot of back and forth people getting annoyed and upset with Python. Would, so would they fix it if somebody had to then patch it? Yeah. So no. Yeah. I, there are patches, I believe. I'm not, oh, well, I might be wrong, but saying you have a patch for a bug in Python does not mean they're even yeah. remotely interested in accepting it. <laughs> I have well, a little bit of 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 a little bit patch. They can go into the NetBSD package source. That's correct. That would be true. I'm not, now that I'm th talking about it, though, I don't think there is a patch. I think it's just a more of a general list of work. <laughs> so uh, I have a free pass if it's hundred at all. Okay. I'm um, running like three months from Chase because I've seen you have to be every month for free that has a carry some. Yes. Drive installer. So my Max four thousand has a tape drive. I don't have tape. Yes. Oh. I don't have a tape port. In fact, that Max four thousand uses uh, DSSI disks, which yeah. which would have made it, quote, faster if it was using those disks. Although I think I proved that the bottleneck is actually the CPU, not the hard drive on it. So I'm using a SCSI hard drive, but you would get better disk throughput had I used the DSI I controller. But now that I'm speaking again, I don't think NetBSD supports the onboard DSSI, because that doesn't have to speak uh, QBus to work. Right. But I think NetBSD also doesn't support it. So yes. you speak mom. Yeah. What's that? It's operation protocol. The, 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 mm -hmm. the DAC boot protocol. Yeah. You can boot VMS over mom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that you don't need to use a key ticket. You don't need to find the tape. You can download VMS <laughs> off the internet and boot it over mom from the mom server. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That makes sense. I also have a CD. Oh, yeah. I just found Eldrix. What's that? I just found Eldrix. You found Eldrix? It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably very full of holes. It looks, looks like 27444 yeah. is the. Uh, so, if there's anything, uh, any other questions? Does anybody want to see this run anything right now? or we're, I I, I'm interested in binder. Executable size of, of, of libc.xo. Okay, where am I going to find that? Oh, you know, whatever your shared library is. Probably lib lib c. Uh, lib 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 c star. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, lib yeah. c dot star. <laughs> yeah, lib c dot star. Yeah. Yep. Try that again. Well, those are things we can teach you to. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's pointing it to. It's under user. It's under slash lib. Yeah. 
All right. Oh, yeah. Do you want me to find it here? Yeah. yeah just recall and delete user off your last command. Here you go. 1.2 max. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Do you have my gig in this place? You might try it down if you want to. Trade off the binary sides. Huh? The trade off is the binary sides. The binary side, you need a lot of disk space, but you don't have to run a runtime winter every time you accept something. I think that's the this kind of CPU is so damn slow. <laughs> trying to do runtime linking is just crazy on it. It the day. look like you have a lot of volunteers. Everybody wants to stay. We run it and set up my backs. Yeah, but the far, so, the far side of that is it doesn't have a lot of memory in shared libraries. Might be helping them with memory yeah. substantially. So they could encourage me to think of the CR AMD 64 and 5.4 meg. Huh? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what uh, Perl looks like. Oh, yeah. Which I, well, just Perl should just type Perl. Yeah. Yeah. Perl dash E. Echo hello. I don't know if we're comparing. Oh, oh dash E. What do you want? Echo. Yeah. Sorry, so I don't do AMD 64. Oh, let's see. Uh, How am I doing? Point it? five. It's print in the world. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Uh, for comparison, before you lose that, it's at one point two, and uh, modern AMD it's one point five. Oh, okay. So, All right. A little bit smaller. Do I need quotes? Just tell me. Yeah, he's getting Arabic. <laughs>